Middle School Ignite. I am so glad that you are watching this. My name is Miss Christine from Grace Lutheran Ministries, and it feels like it's been forever, so I'm really excited to be back teaching you this week. Um, for those of you that don't know, I have been quarantined for the last two weeks after being exposed to the virus. And I know many of you are currently in a quarantine or it's something that you have already walked through during this crazy season. So you may know exactly what it feels like to be told that your life is being put on pause for 14 days straight. At the very least, I bet everyone knows someone that has received that news. I'm not sure how you responded to the news that you were quarantined, but when I first found out I was a close contact, I felt sheer panic. See, I am a huge extrovert and I live alone. Actually, right now we're in the stairwell of my condo. So the idea of quarantine sounded like pure torture to me. I don't do well without other people. I don't do well with silence. I get anxious and stir crazy. You see, when we were in the full lockdown back in like March, April, I moved into my friend's house just to avoid being alone. That's how much I hate feeling lonely. I wasn't built for quarantine. <laughs> Honestly, none of us really are. Overall, it truly wasn't as awful as I thought it would be, but my experience with quarantine gave me time to stop and reflect about everything that we've been through the past nine months as people. Everything that you all have been through the past nine months. If you had told February Christine that she would have to spend 14 days in her house alone in order to keep other people safe, it would have felt like the most foreign, bizarre idea in the world. Add in the political unrest, the racial tensions, the election, the mental health challenges, quarantine, sicknesses, virtual schooling, all of it, it seems like the most foundational things in our life, in our world, things like church, school, government, all those things feel different and they look different now. At different points during this year, I have felt fearful, angry, hopeless, confused, and anxious. I don't think I'm alone. It took quarantine for me to truly stop and try to process everything that has been thrown up thrown at us during this time. So I want to give us the opportunity to do that now. How has your life changed since COVID? What emotions have you felt during this time? Go ahead, pause this video and share with your group. Amid all these troubles, emotions, and pain, have you ever asked yourself, where is God in all of this? This time in history is like no other. God seems to be grabbing the attention of the entire world. If he is trying to get our attention, what do you imagine he wants us to know? How do we live in our current situation without being totally and utterly stressed out? How can we live each day as his word says we can, with peace, joy, love, and faith in the midst of so much stress? Life as we knew it is gone, and our world is kind of in shambles. Your family might be divided when it comes to politics. You don't know if you'll be able to go to school tomorrow. And for many of you, church happens on your TV now. So where is God? What did we do to deserve all of this uncertainty that we're facing? When is he going to be able to make things right and normal again? I've asked all those questions before, and I imagine you have also found yourself asking those questions. So what's the good news? Well, we should be asking those questions. Those are good questions. And those questions mean that we are still turning to God in the midst of this chaos. And when we turn to God, even in the midst of negative emotions, doubts, and questions, he will show up. He'll show up. God is not afraid of you, your questions, or your emotions. Who is God in the midst of chaos? Not surprisingly, the Bible has an answer for us. The answer is found in Psalm 46. Now, I want you to start turning to Psalm 46 in your Bibles as I tell you a little bit more about the book of Psalm. The Psalms are inspired by God to poetically reflect humanity's journey with him. Each Psalm serves, as a, serves a different purpose such as a personal or communal lament with sorrow, a hymn, a song, a reflection, or a declaration. 
Many of these were set to music and intended to be shared publicly, even when they were confessing a really revealing confession, like in Psalm 51, when David admits to adultery. Although many people think of David when they think of the Psalms, there are at least eight other authors of the Psalms. The 150 Psalms were written over a period of nearly 700 years. I know. During all that time and throughout history, this book has served as the prayer book of God's people. It was quoted by Jesus more than any other book in the Bible, so that's pretty important. And I think it was Jesus's favorite book because each psalm is like a diary entry that puts on display just how intimate our relationship with God can be. This book puts the truth on display. The truth that we can bring the good, the bad, and the ugly to God. That we can be sad and angry and still praise God. That we can be confessing terrible sin and be broken inside and still find peace. That is where the beauty of the psalms is found. I love this quote from Martin Luther about the Psalms. He says this, Where does one find finer words of joy than in the Psalms of praise and thanksgiving? Where do you find deeper, more sorrowful, more pitiful words of sadness than in the Psalms of lamentation? And that they speak these words to God and with God. This, I repeat, is the best thing of all. Hmm. Have you ever felt like you didn't know the words to say when you pray? Like you didn't know how to express how you were feeling to God Or did you even wonder if you're allowed to have those kind of feelings and emotions towards God? Well, the gifts of the Psalms is that they give us the words to say when we don't know what to pray. You can pray through the Psalms. They certainly give us permission to be honest and vulnerable with God. God wants to hear from us and cares about our thoughts and troubles, even when we're angry with him. And like we talked about before, those troubles are everywhere right now. They're everywhere. I promised that the answer to our question, who is God in the midst of this chaos, would be found in Psalm 46. So let's break it down. I'm going to read you Psalm 46. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I wanted to read that psalm all the way through so you can hear how beautiful it is. This psalm was written when God's people were surrounded by enemy armies. The world as they knew it was crashing down all around them. Does that sound familiar? They were seeking security, safety, and victory. Does that sound familiar? I think that is what has made this psalm my favorite piece of scripture for most of my life. It is the place I go to when I feel overwhelmed, fearful, or anxious. It also contains my confirmation verse, Be still and know that I am God. It is in this psalm that I can be reminded that my God is powerful, personal, and present in the midst of crisis. But I want to hear from you guys. What promises in this psalm bring you the most comfort? Pause this video and talk with your group about it. This psalm shows us who our God is in the midst of chaos. He is powerful, personal, and present. So let's start with powerful. The first verse of this psalm describes God as a refuge, strength, and a very present help in trouble. Not only is God strong and willing to help, he wants to be our refuge, which is kind of a word that we don't use a lot. A refuge is the same thing as a fort, fortress. Have you ever built a snow fort before an epic snowball fight? A weak fort in that situation is not good at all. A good fort is there to offer protection, to be a safe, strong, and secure place to run to when you are afraid. 
I love this quote. Refuge is where the fearful go to become fearless because they are anchored in the safe harbor of God's protection. That is who God is to me. He is my refuge, my place to run to when I feel afraid. And he is a good refuge because of his power and his strength. I know he can protect me from the biggest enemies of all, which is sin, death, and the devil. Those are our true enemies because Jesus already defeated those things on the cross. The other part of this psalm that really speaks to God's power is this verse. It says, he utters his voice and the earth melts. That's pretty intimidating, right? God's voice had the power to create the universe and he has the power to melt it. It's pretty intense. His voice controls all of nature. Remember when Jesus told the wind and the waves to be still and they actually listened to him? His voice rose the dead from the grave. His voice has the power to forgive sins. God's voice will also one day bring destruction. His judgment is coming, but we need not fear anything because his voice that controls the universe loves you. He longs to be a place of safety and comfort for you. That brings us to the second thing that God is in the midst of chaos. He is personal. Check out verse 5. Verse 5 says, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. That describes a pretty personal relationship. The mighty ruler of the universe makes the odd but marvelous choice to reside on earth with, with his people. He chose to send Jesus into this world to live and to teach among us. He chooses to be within his church through the body and the blood of Jesus. He's a personal God after your heart. We talked about, his, about this earlier, but I wanted to make sure you understand. God cares about your emotions. He cares about what you're feeling. Whether you're like me and you're battling loneliness in quarantine, or you're battling overwhelm of virtual schooling, or you're angry about current politics, God cares about those emotions and he can handle them because he cares about you. He's a personal God. Look at verse seven. It says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. That first part, the Lord of hosts, reminds us that our God controls armies of angels. He is mighty over the invisible and visible things of this world. But that second part, the God of Jacob being our fortress, that recalls the promise that God made way back when we talked about Abraham. The promise that God will be with his people always. That promise was made out of God's relationship with his people. Remember, God will be faithful even when we are faithless. The God that commands angels promises to be with you. That shows his power and his might. But the fact that the God of Jacob is your fortress, now that shows his grace and promise. Finally, in the midst of chaos, our God is present. Our God is real and he is present and he is near. This brings us to my all-time favorite verse, be still and know that I am God. As someone who has struggled with anxiety their entire life, this verse has become an anchor for my soul. I have it all over my office and home, probably because I'm so bad at it. Even during quarantine, I found it hard to be still and spend time with God, to acknowledge his presence and just be with him. I would rather be doing something for God rather than sitting back and enjoying his presence. The problem is, this is the only verse of this psalm that is in quotes. It's in quotes because it is God speaking, and he is not speaking with a suggestion or a good idea. He is speaking a command to his people. It's one thing to be still. It's another thing to know that he is God. Today is a chance to ask yourself, how are you doing in those two things? In the chaos that we've been thrown into the last few months, how are you doing at being still? How are you doing at knowing he is God? When we are still, we can know that God is almighty, that God is with us, that God is our refuge and our fortress, and that God is fighting for us. Being still means letting go, putting your hands down your side and stopping your fighting. You cease striving. It requires humility. You admit that you can't do it all and you release control. Knowing that he is God implies that we use our brain. We don't just empty it. We can know in our souls that God is a place of security in an insecure world. That our strength comes from a God who cannot change. 
who can't break his promises. We know who he is in the midst of chaos. So next time you are asking yourself all the questions about what comes next in this crazy COVID season of life, next time you are feeling all the emotions we talked about earlier, I hope you can start to do what I do when I'm overwhelmed. I repeat that verse, my life verse to myself. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. That's why I have it all over my home and office, like I said. That reminder allows me to stop and breathe just long enough for me to remember who God is and what he has done for me. To remember that he is real and present and I am not God. This always works because it shifts my focus to God, not on myself. When I focus on who God is in the midst of the chaos, when I remember how powerful he is, when I remember how personally he loves me, when I remember that he is present and close to me, well, then my worry turns to worship and praise. Worship becomes my weapon. I know that God is fighting for me, that the battle is his. All I have to do is be still, take a deep breath, and know that he is my God. You know, we've been in a storm. In fact, we are still in a storm right now. But we also have a God who calms storms. The storms inside of us and the storms outside of us. If we all learned during this season how to truly trust our God with our emotions, imagine the kind of intimacy and the kind of relationship we would have with him. Imagine how much better we could love our family and our friends during this time. Imagine the peace that would come with being still and knowing that he is God and you are not. To know that you can rest in him even in the chaos. Did you guys notice something else in this psalm? It says Selah after every major section of the song. That word instructs the singers to take a pause, to take time and reflect. And that's exactly what I want you to do in your small groups tonight. Reflect on the season of your life. Reflect on how you've been showing up. Reflect on how we can know who God is in the chaos, how he can become your refuge, the place you run to for safety and security. Reflect on how you can be still and know that he is God. To close our time together, I'm going to read you a prayer based off of Psalm 22. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Dear God, why are you so far from me? I can no longer feel you near. I reach desperately for you, but I cannot find you. I know you are holy and righteous and everywhere present. The saints of the past years believed in you and trusted you. You responded to their cries. They sought for you and they found you. It is no wonder that your praises were constantly on their lips, but I feel empty and insignificant. I risk all in following what I feel to be your will for me, yet even my friends fail to support me and they actually turn against me. I know that you have cared for me through these many years, but God, I need you now. I am in trouble and I can't find you or feel you to be near. I feel in this moment as if I'm falling apart. Nothing seems to make sense anymore. Everything I attempt to do ends in failure. But the fact is, you are not far off. In fact, you are real. You know both my feelings and my failings. Yet you love me and accept me. You will save me. You have saved me, even from myself. Thus, I will continue to sing your praises. In spite of or in scorn of my feelings, I will celebrate your loving presence. As despicable as I may feel at times, you do not despise me, nor will you leave me. Your love is personal and it is eternal. I dedicate myself anew to you, O Lord. I will serve you. You are my God. I will proclaim your name and proclaim your love to those all about me. For you have saved me. For you are victorious. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. See you next week, guys. Bye.